Welcome back to the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast. Uh, this is our conversation series. Greg and I were, you know, we've always considered you, you know, people that say they're listeners to the show. We just consider you guys colleagues that don't have a podcast. So we know it's a high level audience. And we were sitting around and saying, what can we do in 2022 to kick it up a notch? We said, why don't we start recording the kind of podcasts that we would want to listen to? And we're just going to get the hell out of the way. And so that's our conversation series. On today's show, we have Webster's, Webster Marsh. He is a self-proclaimed lighting control specialist. Um, he has a company where um, he consults on education. It's called Penumbra Controls. And he works for the Boston Illumination Group. We're going to see what he's got today on Get a Grip on Lighting. And in the red corner, <laughs> we have Ron Kuzmar. Okay. He's an integrator. He actually is in the field. He speaks to the customer. He's on, when the controls go in, he's there with the iPad or the computer program, Bluetooth, Mesh, Zigbee, whatever you want. So there it is. This episode of the show, folks, is sponsored by Keystone Technologies. That's right. K-E-Y-S-T-O-N-E-T-E-C-H dot com, baby. That's light made easy. Retrofit Kings, you know I love them. I go to KeystoneTech.com every day, brother. That's legit. I do. And of course, presented by the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors. Get associated, get educated, go to NAILD.org. Over to Webster and Ron. All right. Thank you. So, Ron, thanks for joining me today. Um, you know, the point of this conversation is really just to give people an idea of what an integrator is and does, specifically lighting control systems integrators. I mean, you know, a lot of people use the term integrator integration, and they may or may not understand what they're actually talking about. And so that's why I invited you here today to kind of talk about what it is that you do, how do you get involved in a project, how lighting designers can can work with you. So, yes. um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, you know, at really as an integrator, at the end of the day, at the highest level, the our job is really to help the designer and the client's dreams really come to reality, right? To bring that entire system to life, to take all of the various lighting elements, regardless of manufacturer, and bring everything under one umbrella that they can control from a central interface so that everything communicates and works exactly as they sort of planned and envisioned. And in some cases, give them more than they thought was possible. So, I mean, if I'm a lighting designer and I, I'm working with a controls rep, how does that differ from what I'm doing with you? Because a lot of reps nowadays will actually do design work for lighting designers and they'll hand them documentation and do all of that. So what, what is the point of an integrator if I can just go over to my rep and say, hey, do this for me. Yeah. So the nine times out of 10, the rep's not going to be the one in the field, right? They're not going to be the one that does all the drawings that is hands in the field with the electrical contractor that is working with the owner to take care of everything out there, you know, assigning IP addresses and getting on their computer and doing all that. In my experience, a lot of reps often tend to have uh, knowledge in one or two, you know, lines. A lot of times it's the lines in which they rep. And that's not always the best application for the project, right? A lot of times we need to cross manufacturers. We need to cross those reps boundaries, get a, you know, beyond what they know, beyond the lines that they carry and do what's best for the client. And that's where we really come in because we can come in and look at everything they have and kind of rip it apart a little bit because we're a third party at that point. So we get to come in and sort of rip it apart and say, no, I don't like this. I wouldn't do it this way. I really think we should put, you know, additional DMX out here. We should really change this over to network. Let's not use this controller. It's not ideal. Well, why do we have four controllers when we can have one, you know, and that's where we really get to come in and shine. Yeah. So, I mean, the whole point here is that you're really being able to stay agnostic to the manufacturers. And so if I, am a lighting designer and I am working on a lighting control system and I'm really invested in a project and I want it to be successful, what you're saying is, you know, I should reach out to you instead of my sales rep. Yes, no, absolutely. Right. Because I, I've upset a lot of manufacturers <laughs> over the years because, you know, we're, like I said, we're dealers for a lot of different manufacturers and I am blatantly honest with all of them. And I tell them at the end of the day, 
I don't care if I don't sell your equipment this year because I'm going to do what's best for the client and what's best for the project. And I've upset a lot of people and I've missed a lot of sales targets because if I don't feel I, you know, I had the right application for that manufacturer or product, I'm just not going to use it. I'm not, for us, it's not about what's going to gross me the highest margin. What's going to do this? What's going to do that? I want the project to work. I want the project to be there. I want to know that for the next 20 years, this thing's going to be rock solid. I don't want a phone call every week. I don't want to have to go to site to support it. I want it to work and work the way it's intended. And so on that point with, with future-proofing a project, I mean, you are there to support the project once it's completed. So if something goes wrong, somebody's going to call you up, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. Ideally, that's the goal. And, and we, I will be honest, we are moving more and more projects over to cloud access now um, so that we can remote into them. So, you know, before we used to have to have remote access computers on site and dial in, we're moving more and more projects over to cloud because it's faster, it's quicker, we can get into sites fast, um, you know, a lot easier. Um, and it just, it saves us from having to go out to site and troubleshoot a lot of things. There's a lot that can be done remotely, especially if you've got cameras, so you can actually see what you're doing. A lot of little things can be done very quickly remotely without having to worry about how do I get a tech there? How do I do this? Uh, you know, just last week, I was on a project and I was able to um, remote in at six o'clock at night on a Friday to a job site down in Florida. And I'm here, you know, north of Boston because they had a quick issue and I was able to update the configuration, load it back into the controller. And in five minutes, they were off and running and I didn't have to worry about how do I find someone near the Fort Myers area who can run down and deal with this. And so, you know, when it comes to that, I mean, it sounds like from your perspective, you're really also operating similarly to a facilities manager when they need some kind of upgrade. So um, when it comes to that sort of interaction, do you recommend that people work with, a, with their own in-house staff or is it sort of like an ongoing agreement that we're going to upgrade this stuff? Yeah. So I mean, I guess it depends on the in-house staff, right? A, a lot of times, you know, there are certain applications where in-house staff can handle it, right? And they can absolutely be trained and they can do a lot of the work, but they're 99% of the time that doesn't work out, right? Not everybody is Disney or some sort of theme park that has the staff to do this, right? A lot of times it's some property manager that owns an office building and, and they know how to press red on the controller and that's what they know how to do. So for us, a lot of it is ongoing maintenance and having sort of a service contract with people and being there for them to make sure they have the upgrades they need, you know, do annual programming adjustments for them, you know, be there when, you know, something happens and they say, hey, you know, the owner's coming to town, we really need it, this color purple tonight. Okay, great. And just take care of it. And being able to provide not only ourselves, but the owner with that remote access so that, you know, God forbid they're on vacation in Cancun, they can still dial into their system and make the adjustments they need to make. And so, I mean, with with that in mind, I mean, uh, like, what are we talking price point wise? I mean, because a lot of people, when they start getting familiar with integrators, they'll balk at the idea of paying additional money for, for a service. They're not really clear on what it is to begin with. So, you know, like, where is the price point here in relationship to the project itself? Is this like an like you said, ongoing service agreements. So, you know, is that like an annual fee that they have to pay or something? Yeah. So a lot of people, it is an annual fee, but not everyone takes it. Right. And, and they don't have to, right. It's not something that's required. People, we have certain sites that don't want sort of the annual help and they say, oh, we're good with the programming. And they'll call us once or twice a year and say, Hey, can you come in and just make this change at the end of the day? Are they saving any money? Not usually. Uh, maybe they save a couple of bucks if it was a couple of quick things they needed. Um, you know, but it's but it's, it's not a, like it's their your manufacturer service agreement no. where you have to agree at the outset. Yes, we're going to continue to pay this. Otherwise, they're like, nope, you didn't pay for the service agreement, so sucks to be no. you. No, no, exactly. And, and honestly, and this this is my own fault as well as my companies, but we don't walk away from projects either, right? So it's just because someone doesn't sign the service agreement, if there's something that's going on, especially right from the onset, right? If it's something that's warranty related, we're going to take care of it. Outside of that warranty period, 
you know, if it's something simple, and especially if I can log in and have remote access, it's not a big deal. I got to send somebody to site. That's a little bit of a different story. But if I can take five minutes on the computer and take care of it for the client, you know, good faith goes a long way. And, and, you know, that's a lot of what we want to do is we want to be there to support our clients regardless. Yeah. So, I mean, from a value added perspective, if I'm a lighting designer and I'm working on a project, and I'm trying to convince the owner or, or my client to agree. Yes, this is an ad, a value added service that I'm adding to the project. It may be slightly higher in expense, but in the long run, you know, it's going to be a really beneficial relationship. That might be a good opportunity for me to say, hey, you know, they will support the project through and through. It's not going to be, you know, well, you know, here's where the line ends and, and we've we've already finished our documentation. So, um, you know, you got to pay us extra money to, to even touch the project. Um, you know, it, it's really good to know that from that perspective. You know, otherwise, a lot of people go, well, you know, an integrator is just an added cost to my project. I'm not going to pay for this. Yeah, um, yeah. And so from the owner's perspective, you know, if I want something really fancy, really customizable, you know, that's something that you do, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So that's a lot of what we do for our clients is we come in, you know, because with everything being web-based, everything has some sort of internal web server, right? So a huge part of what we do, whether it's on the cloud or, or internally on that web server, is we do a lot of customization. We do a lot of custom web interfaces for clients where we can show them you know, 2D or 3D, basically models of their building um, or their bridge or whatever it is, give them group selection, the ability to change color on all those, recall presets, adjust their calendar and do all of that through their custom interface so they don't have to learn any software because most of these end users don't want to learn any software. They don't want to know how this lighting system works. They just want to know that it works. So for them to be able to to go into a web interface that's saved on their desktop and just hit this button and change the schedule for the day or say, I really want you know my building to be red, white, and blue, and they select their groups and they set it and they walk away. It's very powerful for a lot of clients to be able to do that. And it also, we have a lot of venues where we will give them custom presets. So whether they're having a wedding or some sort of private function or someone's renting out a facility, they can set those colors with their client so they can stand outside at a completely you know separate meeting from the event day and say cool what do you really want this to do what do you want those colors to be set it they can record it as one of their custom presets record it to the schedule you know two weeks in advance three weeks in advance and they're done and they don't have to bring anybody in they don't have to call in another company to come light up the building something special for that night because they can do it all themselves which is awesome. I mean, you know, from a lighting designer standpoint, it's almost like, you know, I don't have to worry about the project if I hire you. I mean, from a integrator's perspective, would you say that the services that you provide are pretty common for a lighting control systems integrator? Or so, is this? Yeah. Yes and no. Right. So uh, for, for a lot of the stuff we do, yes. The web interfaces, no. Uh, not every integrator out there is providing all these custom web interfaces. We happen to be very lucky uh, that we have, uh, you know, a guy internally who's very good with, you know, building essentially these websites. It's basically what they are, right? And building the code and doing all that. And he's been doing it for a few years and he's, he's gotten really good at it. So we're really lucky there. And we have some great resources as well um, for that kind of stuff. But not everyone's doing that. That's not something that every integrator is doing. Most integrators can, you know, they can get your project off the ground and they can get you up and going, but they're not providing that value add of that custom web interface and everything that, that we can offer. And so if I'm, if I want to put you on a project, you know, what's going to be the best process here and to, to make sure that you're going to provide all the services that I need? Yeah. So ideally we want to be involved as early as possible. And I know that's not always feasible because then there's always, there's always that question about how, well, how does the integrator get involved? And there's a couple different ways. If it's early enough in the project and the owner understands that, Hey, we're going to have 10 different lighting systems and we want them all to communicate, then the owner can look at bringing us in, you know, under sort of the guidance of the specifier or the designer and say, hey, look, we, we really, we want to bring them into the team now. We want them in the conversation for controls so we can tie everything in together. 
Unfortunately, that doesn't always happen. It is starting to happen more frequently, but it doesn't always happen. So a lot of what we're seeing now still is we're being put in the specification and we get brought in, you know, so a lot of times it's under section 26, under the electrical specification, we get brought in that way. And then, so we're already being brought in after the electrical contractor's been, you know, one, they've already started submittals in a lot of cases and they're sort of doing everything they're off and running. And then we're coming in and having to try and hold them back a little bit and go, whoa, 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 fixture's okay, but we need to change out some of this hardware. We need to talk about this. We need to get back in front of the owner and the, the specifier and the designer and say, look, I think we should you know, look at maybe tweaking this or, or hey, they, they had the control system in there, but there's nothing in here about the DMX integration or the parts and pieces needed to get network and data to all of these. And a lot of times that ends up being part of the package that we have to provide to the contractor. Um, and that's really important and, to know too, you know, and is that, yeah, that I remember talking to you in the past where, you know, sometimes it's like the contractor contacts you and says, Hey, I need this turned around really quickly. I need an estimate. And so it's like instantaneous, you need to have some information, which is how bids operate a lot right now, where it's like instant boom, boom, boom. But, you know, in some cases you are on the spec and some cases you're not on the spec. And it's just because the contractor is savvy enough to know that there's DMX involved that they go, oh, we need port lighting involved here. You know, call Ron up. Um, and so from that perspective, I mean, a lighting designer may not even realize that you're on a project until it's awarded, it's installed, and then they show up for their site visit. And it's like, oh, port lighting's involved. Yep. Yeah, that, that has happened. We try to avoid that as much as possible, right? So uh, a lot of times they find out sooner because we send back an RFI with a whole bunch of questions going, well, what about? <laughs> so a lot of times they find out sooner than that, but it has happened where, you know, we've been on that first site walk and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, hey, how are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, as far as things go, the owner may actually be paying for the services without realizing it. And so putting a name behind it may actually make them more aware of the fact that it's been an ongoing service. They just didn't realize that there's there's more capabilities with it. There's, there's more that they can do with it pre-bid so that yeah. they can really make sure that things are to what they want them to do. And especially with lighting controls right now, lighting controls, everybody hates lighting controls if they don't understand right. them because yep. things go wrong. People override the system because it doesn't work the way they want it to. And so your argument here is, you know, if, if a lighting designer grabs you at the beginning of a design process and says, Hey, can you help make sure that this project goes really well? There you go. You know, yeah. Ear earlier gonna... is better. Yeah. Earlier is better. A lot of times we get stuck, right? Be working under the electrical contractor. They're the ones that bring us in. It's their package. So we're kind of at their mercy too, right? Because technically at that point, my contract is with the EC. So I'm trying to deal with the owner and do all this and do all that. And then all of a sudden we get to the end of the project and the electrician says, oh, we're over hours and this and that, but there's still things to be done. And it just it can get a little messy sometimes at the end when we're right, because I'm trying to do what's best for the client. I'm trying to finish the work that needs to be done, but the electricians sometimes a little lackluster to get things. And so a way up. to, a way to kind of smooth that over is to make sure that the specification has enough um, so that the contractor can bid those hours correctly. Because yeah. it, what you're saying basically is the contractor is going to start looking at the, their watch and going, okay, you can't do that because we don't have enough money to pay you to do that. Now, right. how does that reconcile with this making sure that the project's going to work no matter what the cost is? Yeah, so that one's tough, right? Because making it work no matter what the cost is, sometimes that can get a little tricky too. Because especially if we get brought in after and if the designer wasn't as sort of keen on controls, and now all of a sudden there's this huge controls package based on the narrative and what the owner wants that no one had kind of budgeted for. We've run into that too, where all of a sudden there's, there's these issues where the owner's freaking out at the cost of these controls packages because they were never budgeted in, be, you know, cause it was yeah, missed, I remember essentially. There was a project that um, I was a part of a separate phase for that you got pulled into to help make sure that things were working. Cause it just, there was 
like you said, no specification, no budget, no nothing for controls. And there was this big DMX system that was expected to work flawlessly. And so the contractor did their best, installed what they could, but then went, whoa, we're way over our heads on this. And that's yeah. how they actually ran into you guys because yep. beforehand they hadn't thought about integrators. And so from a contractor's perspective, it may actually be a good idea to get close knit with, with an integrator as well, just so that they have somebody in their back pocket if they do start drowning on a project. Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely for the electrical contractors, you know, for sure. It's good for them to sort of have us in their back pocket. So when something happens, they can go, okay, we need a little help with this. How how do we address these fixtures? How does this work? Why why are these lights randomly flashing? How do I fix this? You know, because a lot of these guys don't understand, you know, the limitations of of DMX or, you know, the fact that you need to terminate the end of your run or you know, it's just a, it's a lot of silly things, right? More often than not that these guys just miss, but they're electrical contractors. The, you know, unless they're specifically in the controls division, a lot of these guys don't know, right? They, they're, they're line voltage guys. They don't do a lot of the low voltage. So, and it controls is, um, it can get, it can get tricky real fast on them, unfortunately. Right. And, and, uh, you know, to your point, I mean, a lot of what they do is line voltage runs power to devices, but from your side, you're really futzing with the, the parts and pieces of the intelligence. I think it, was it you who said it's, uh, smarts and, uh, the the electrical contractor does the parts so it's smarts and parts and so smarts and parts i did not yeah. say that but i have heard that before <laughs> i can't take credit for that unfortunately but it is good <laughs> smarts and parts. but yeah so i mean an integrator deals with the smarts contractor deals with the parts yep um, absolutely and so i mean you know that uh, hopefully this is enough information for our, our listeners and, and viewers to really get an idea of what it is that you do but um you know integration really is an essential part of a project nowadays when it comes especially to networked lighting controls or or dmx so um you know from just kind of wrap this up you know getting an integrator involved early on in a project is really essential especially if you're doing something really high design really customizable um but also so that the contractor can bid it accordingly make sure that the you're within budget. But I mean, even after the fact, if for some reason a project's already going installation wise, you could get grabbed and pulled into a project. It might be a cost adder, but it's really yep. going to be an added benefit to the project to have you involved, even after you're in installation and things are already going haywire, which probably yep. is where your biggest, you know, marketing is. You know, you probably right. get those contractors who are like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Please help. Yep. Yeah, it does happen, unfortunately, you know, and, and uh, at that point, unfortunately, it usually ends up costing a lot more to fix it than it's worth. Right. So we that's part of why we like to get in early, because, yes, there's an added expense, but a lot of times we can also save money for the contractor, too. Right. So a lot of these time, a lot of guys will get systems and they'll get this from manufacturer A and this from manufacturer B and this from manufacturer C. And there was no sort of centralized control system. So each manufacturer provides their own controls. And then all of a sudden the owner says, well, I want everything to work together, but there's no way to tie these three separate controllers together. So now all of a sudden we get brought in, these controllers have already been purchased. Now they're all being ripped out. Things are being rewired, right? So while yes, there's still an added expense for us, a lot of times we can come in and look at, you know, how do we save some cost off of this? Or how do we modify this to, you know, so that we can save the contractor some money. So that that's a big piece of it too. So Unfortunately, coming in at the end is, is tough, right? There's a lot of time and money that gets spent into troubleshooting sometimes just to try and fix things. But, you know, we, we can, we can do it. We can get it done. We can get it fixed. It's, uh, it's just sometimes like, how do they pull this wire there through this finished space that if they had only known two months ago, wouldn't have been an <laughs> issue. Well, thank you so much, Ron. I really appreciate it. No problem. Thank you. Well, I think Webster Marsh and Ron Kuzmar just hit it out of the park. I love that podcast. I hope you did too. This episode is brought to you by Keystone Technologies. Go to K-E-Y-S-T-O-N-E-T-E-C-H.com. That's KeystoneTech.com. Of course, light made easy, brother, the easy folks. Check them out. KeystoneTech.com. And of course, presented by the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors and in cooperation with the Lighting Agora. That's right. This episode is also presented by the Lighting Agora. 
Check them out. Bye for now.